Thank you. Oh, good afternoon. I'd like to start by emphatically thanking Mitchell and no less Gail, Jeff, and uh, Peter for organizing this. I've had a lot of fun the last couple of days. I uh, think it's a uh, shared experience. This talk is going to be different in two ways from the previous talks. The talks that you've been hearing are talks about results. I'm going to give you a front end talk, you know, the things that uh, might come as uh, time goes on. And the other uh, difference is that this is dramatically shorter than the other talks, which I think will probably uh, fit reasonably well. So it's about scientific and practical questions having to do with what I would like to call LENR, Lattice Enabled Nuclear Reactions. I'm, I think that uh, particular acronym has some traction and I uh, prefer this to uh, Lattice Assisted uh, due respect to uh, Mitchell on that point. So the motivations for this, of course curiosity often drives scientific research, but so do questions. So it's worthwhile posing questions. And there are several significant and basic questions that are not getting the attention that I think they deserve as far as I'm concerned. So another reason is LENR questions are needed for program planning. I, I'm of the opinion that before too long, agencies in the US, Korea, and elsewhere will start paying attention to funding this area. And the DOE, for instance, likes <coughs> question or inquiry-based proposals. They don't want a proposal that I'm going to apply my latest diagnostic to my latest idea kind of thing. In fact, uh, I was at the uh, hot fusion part of the DOE last week. They gave a talk on LENR at their invitation, half a dozen people. And we had a very good hour and a half long discussion, the bottom line of which was rather amusing. One of the people said that I should go to ARPA-E and start a program on, <laughs> on LENR. I, uh, am, um, I think I still pass a sanity test. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> as as uh, attractive that, as that might be to some people. So by posing questions, I'm trying to stir the pot, you know, uh, get interested in new, exper new experiments. Now, if you look back a few years ago, I published a uh, list of uh, all 50 questions and answers about this subject in Infinite Energy magazine. Widely ignored. I got almost no feedback. Okay, so you can say, okay, here you are doing it again, Nagel. What are you, a slow learner? And, uh, and uh, I, I would like to think that instead of being a slow learner, I'm stubborn. I think it's still worth asking questions. So I've scoped this down from like 50 questions to a couple dozen questions, and I'll be uh, talking about a few of those in the next few minutes. Okay, let's start out with mechanism. Is there one or, or are there more than one basic mechanisms active in these diverse experiments? with the diverse results. You know, there are lots of different kinds of chemical reactions. And w what compels us to think that of the two or three or stop when you want, dozen theories on LENR that there's going to be a winner-take-all situation? Now, Ed Storms thinks so. That was the uh, part of the talk that he gave at ICCF uh, 18. But um, anyway, it is possible that these various LENR products that we uh, see in the experiments are, in fact, due to different mechanisms. Now, um, you know, I, I, I expect to get some uh, substantial feedback from this. And, um, you know, my response to criticism of this question is, show me the empirical database that enables you to argue that this is a one mechanism field. Okay, so that, that's one it's of the not, questions. Pardon? It's not a one mechanism field. Yeah, that's one opinion. That's right. Okay, so I'm going to leave that question up here and go on to another question about, um, the mechanism is excess heat from electrochemical and gas loading experiments due to the same mechanism. Show me the data. Okay, I would like to see an experiment done where you take a cylindrical uh, material shown here in cross section, coat it maybe with some nanomaterial, and use it as a cathode, both in an electrochemical experiment and in a gas loading experiment. Exactly the same material, and see if you can get excess heat in both cases. That's not a cheap experiment, but it's something that I think is worth doing. Okay, still on mechanisms. Do LENR occur exclusively as individual uncoupled events or are chain reactions possible? Some of us think that the craters that are produced in many experiments are due to LENR. And if you do the arithmetic, you know, how many MeV per event, you need lots and lots of nearly simultaneous events in space and time in order to produce a crater like this. Okay? That might have some people betting already that it's a chain reaction kind of a thing, that one LENR induces other. Can't, say, can't answer that, but I can pose the question. Okay, now here, here's something that's um, uh, very, very controversial. Is the excess heat due entirely or only partially to nuclear reactions? L-E-N 
nuclear R, okay? <laughs> okay, now what does this have to do? Well, there are some people listed here who have developed theories of what are called compact objects, like muon, like in muon, muon catalyzed fusion. I misspoke. Muon catalyzed fusion. Very small radii, like a one percent of the size of an ordinary atom, with binding energies that are not EV, not MED, but are in the kilovolt range. And the reason this is important is if you have a sketch of energy here versus the distance between two nuclei. Here's the Yukawa potential well due to the strong force. Here's Coulomb repulsion. If you have an ordinary atom, it, it, its nucleus sort of stops here when the electrons bump into each other, so it's got to tunnel through a long distance or just be thrown over the Coulomb barrier. Okay? Where if you have a compact object, it can move in closer and reduce the distance over which tunneling is required, which increases, of course, the probability of nuclear contact, nuclear wave function overlap, and a, and a reaction. So uh, two of us at ICCF18 said, what if these guys who put forward, they're all, yeah, they're all guys. What if these people put forward these compact object theories um, where there's a, uh, 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 an energy of formation, like a few kilovolts, where the total energy that you would get out would be the number of those reactions times the energy per reaction. But then you have this compact object and you've got the proof of principle, namely muon catalyzed fusion, that if you have a compact object, you can get additional nuclear reactions, in that case fusion reactions, and, and if some fraction of them go on to actually have a nuclear reaction, then the energy of that nuclear reaction, so this is KV, this is MEV, would dominate the situation, and, and this KV is much less than, than the MEV. Now, the pushback here is, show me the data for the formation of compact objects. Okay, next. <laughs> There isn't, as far as I know, any empirical data that they exist. Larry, you're shaking your head. Now, why could it, how could it be that after all the work in uh, physics and chemistry in this field over all the years, could these objects be ignored? Well, these people think that it's because it requires the formation, the proximate location of uh, spin-aligned electrons around either a proton or a deuteron, a very rare and difficult condition to produce. Uh, could magnetic fields have any effect of that? Maybe. But anyway, there's been some uh, early but unpublished efforts to try and verify the production of this. And um, they're not public yet. But at any rate, from my perspective, this bag full of theories is in play, as are the theories that Peter and Mark and others in this room have put forward. Okay, so that's, that's why I raised this question. You know, what if no additional nuclear reactions were produced but we could still get excess heat, nothing to do with nuclear reactor, only with the formation of compact objects. I'm not asserting that, I'm not defending it, I'm just saying that there's a body of theory out there that claims that's the case. Okay, now on to the next controversial thing. Do L, E, and R occur on or near surfaces, or in the bulk of materials, or either? Okay, and the cartoon on the top here you know, shows you've seen Missouri surfaces, you've seen Colorado surfaces, you've seen some other surfaces already in these two days. They're a mess. If you read Oriani's paper on what happens to materials when you load them with hydrogen, you find out they're extremely complicated in, in structure as well as in composition. And then you've got all these things going on in, inside the bulk material. Okay, now some of you know my background's in material science, so I'm very fond of the fact that this field depends very heavily on the solution of the material science problem. I'll tell you a very, very brief story. When I was a graduate student, we'd walk into the building where our department was, and here's a sign up on the ceiling that says Material Sciences. Okay, so you go in. Then afterwards, you come out, and somebody had written on the back of the sign facing the rest of the world, Immaterial Sciences. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe that, especially in a multidisciplinary field like this. But anyway, another question, <clears throat> and I'm getting near the end. Do resonances of any kind play a role? Now, well, you've heard some of this yesterday already from uh, Eric's talk, and um, you will recognize the data that he showed you, the famous um, what, 64A data, if I remember correctly. This is earlier data from uh, Mike McCurvey and his colleagues, time this way, uh, excess um, power this way, <laughs> and then the, um, the data is the points, and the uh, equation they developed is in uh, green there. You can look at that remarkable agreement. Okay, but there are areas there where there's substantial disagreement. So <clears throat> I don't know of any other test of McCurvey's equation other than his own. 
can tell me if you know of any, I'd be happy to learn about that. So anyway, I'd like to see if um, the, uh, the examination of electrical and chemical and mechanical resonances within L, E, and R cells would uh, lead us anywhere. I mean, to me, this looks like you've got a re something wandering on and off of resonance. You know, resonances are very finely tuned, they're like a tank circuit, you know, capacitor and a, um, an inductor. Okay, moving along, almost done. Uh, <clears throat> what are the roles of electrical, magnetic, electromagnetic, ultrasound, and other fields? We've heard some of this. I like this uh, graph from uh, Dennis Letts and Scott Chubb, tying this way. Excess power from 0 to 400 milliwatts uh, comes up, switches the magnetic field, jumps up. And you say, ah, that just might have wandered up anyway, but then you switch the magnetic field back and, and it goes down. A clear effect of magnetic field, Mitchell has also published uh, in this area. Okay, so there's a, you know, what about confined field experiments? Uh, at Skinner you do, what, ultrasound and super waves simultaneously, right? Could be very, very, very important. It could be the sweet spot. Well, you know, if 10 years from now we could be, have our homes heated by devices in which you have simultaneous application of dynamic fields that have to be tuned to each other in order to work properly. And then the final data graph I'll show is one of my favorite uh, Graphics from this field, here's time this way, these are half day takes. Temperature up to boiling. This is some Fleischmann and Pons uh, patent, 1990. Okay, I stood in the patent office for hours copying this thing uh, back in 1990 to get this data. And uh, when they added makeup solution here, there was a tick down in um, temperature and one time they did it and the temperature jumped up and wandered up over two and a half days, started boiling, they did it again and it jumped up. You know, a small thermal shock, a couple degrees out of tens of degrees, was enough to enable a rapid transition in the temperature. And, it, you know, it, uh, you can criticize this a lot of different ways. You know, no calorimetry, it was just the thermometry, uh, and so forth. But, you know, you can, the data is spectacular. Look, look at the size of that data there. So, to finish up, the last graphic shows that I have three articles planned for Infinite Energy <coughs> magazine. I have, a, I say, a total of a couple dozen questions. So in the issues that are indicated here, there will be a, 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 a paper on mechanisms, materials, and other on experiments, theories, and computations. Finally, one on engineering and applications. I take this opportunity to emphatically thank Christy. She, if I could <coughs> give him this thought yesterday, she would be here. Christy Fraser has done a real service for the field and things both seen and unseen, and I very much appreciate that. Now, finally, Somebody might say, hey, you're going to talk about practical questions, and you didn't talk about practical questions. Okay. Let me end with just one question. Let's suppose nanomaterials are really, really important to the production of excess heat. Let's suppose you want a heater in your home to work for six months at a time at a few hundred degrees. Sintering of nanomaterials is going to happen and going to happen quickly. How can you defeat sintering over months to avoid the degradation of the active materials in your L E and R reactor. Practical question. So thanks for your attention. I appreciate it. Peter. I think I can answer two of your questions. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. One on the centering of nanomaterials, the gentleman standing next to you tends to put his in zirconium oxide, which gives some of the centering. Um, in terms of the Cooper's uh, formula. Kubri's tested this formula against uh, data subsequently uh, taken at uh, uh, ENIA and Mizu also. And he's been continuing to match his um, equation against uh, uh, data. And he's also been adding to the interpretation of it. Uh, you know, in terms of the constant in front, he's been factoring in the area as possibly being uh, uh, relevant. So instead of just M, it'll be M prime times A, uh, and stuff like that. Well, thank you. I appreciate knowing that. I haven't seen that yet, so I, I thank you for telling me. As far as the um, use of an oxide barrier to uh, defeat sintering, what's the longest uh, time that an oxide-covered nanoparticle has been run at temperature? <coughs> I, 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 <coughs> I have an idea. Uh, I've run for 38 days with no <coughs> degradation. With no degradation. Okay, fine. So that question may be a bummer. <laughs> <Francesca>. <laughs> I have an experience that when the wires work well, over time improve, not degradate. 
uh, but sometimes break into three. But when it works into overtime, we call like high quality red wine Italian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and this touches on a uh, another question about control. You know, why are the companies that are striving to make uh, commercial products uh, working with a gain of a few when very much higher gains have already been uh, uh, reported, not, not verified, reported? And the answer is safety. And uh, I'm thinking of the Levy uh, report on Rossi's experiment where you put the square wave in and it, uh, the, uh, the uh, temperature starts to run away, then they turn it off and it comes back on and, and, and so forth. So. Another uh, very fundamental practical question has to do with control. Yeah. Sir? Are you aware of the system uh, Blacklight Power uses? They claim that the, the electrode shell is going to a lower level than Donald. Yeah. That to me is a very unique situation yeah. where you get the smaller. Yeah, I, I, uh, so there, Mills, Randy Mills was on that list of people who are uh, positing compact optics. There are serious criticisms for his work as well as for all of those people, okay? Mine's and the demonstration that he just had was, uh, mm -hmm. to my taste, unsatisfying. I just had you someone chased to, out of here. Not not to, you have up to be. You're going to write up your observations. No, I, uh, I, these, um, um, yeah, in, in the next three issues of Energy Magazine, there will be three articles <clears> in detail on these. I've got a 50-page manuscript now that I'm going to finish and then parse into the magazine. We're going to take a 10-minute break. We'll see you at 3.40.